How we doing traders? Welcome back. I'm back. You guys probably missed me a little bit. I even missed the show. I was, you know, dealing with the downside of the market just like you guys were dealing with the downside in the market. So hit the thumbs up. We're back. Stock market movers is back. And we got a great show for you guys. We'll talk about initial jobless claims, import prices, retail sales, manufacturing data. And then we got a lot of headlines to touch. ETH merger, uh, railroads uh, strike averted. So definitely going to go ahead and take a look at what's going on there. We got Roku, charging stations and more. A lot to dive into today's show. It's going to be jam-packed. I'll try to get everything in. But like always, I need you guys to start us up with a big thumbs on up if you guys are excited to get into today's action. We also got some great interviews for you today. We got the first one that I think you guys will really love. We're going to get into a company none other than Clean Sparks. Executive Chairman uh, Matthew Schultz will be joining us at 1.15. Uh, exciting because especially with the merger that does happen and you're hearing more and more talks of mining, excited to dive into that conversation with Clean Spark. And then a little bit later at 145, we got Andrew Trasher, uh, portfolio manager of Financial Enhancement Group and founder of the Thrasher Analytics. Let's go ahead. Let's dive into stock market movers. I'm your host, Money Mitch. And let's get the show started. There are three ways to make a living in this business. Be first, be smarter, or cheat. I can't help you cheat, but I can give you the informational edge to help you succeed in the markets. Welcome to Stock Market Movers. All the market moving headlines and expert opinions every day. They say money is the oxygen of capitalism, and I want to breathe more than any man alive. All right, we're getting a little bit of a spike in the markets, and that's probably why you're seeing uh, Jonathan talk about Apple spiking and ripping here. A lot of that is the overall market finally starting to get a spike. After it was kind of beaten down, I mean, on the day, it was getting down there towards the 390s, got as low as 390.22, but like we talk about, look at that. It's holding the support right now. And I think some uh, kind of institutional players are definitely looking at those 390s. You can see it here. I'm going to draw a new line for us um, that's really holding well right now, which is right near this kind of 390.37. Now you're seeing some people step on up off of that level and looking to make the upside call. Well, there you guys see the market trying to push on up. Will this last? We'll see what's going on out there. And Jay calling out the banks have relative strengths. Well, we'll definitely take a look when we get into what was hot and what was not. But I did see the banks continue with their strength. Um, now, this is one that I've been looking at if I wanted to take a kind of a two-day trade on for the comp. But haven't taken a trade in any financials, but we'll take a look at them. Let's start diving into today's topics, right? And so the first topic, of course, we want to talk about is all the kind of financial data that came out today. Of course, uh, there was a lot that came out. Uh, you got core retail sales that came out, retail sales that came out. You had jobless claims that came on out. And you also had the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index. Um, there's a lot that came on out. Uh, of course, initial jobless claims came in better than expected, but import prices saw a smaller drop than the estimate. Retail sales beat expectations, but were negative when it came down to excluding the autos. Uh, manufacturing data did slow uh, show a slowing of the economy. This is that Philly Fed Manufacturing Index. So now it's just kind of left to the Fed to kind of analyze through this data. Of course, what does the Fed talk about always is PCE, PCE, PCE. They say they don't pay attention too much to that CPI data. So at least that's good sign there. If they're not really paying attention to CPI, then PCE wasn't as bad as CPI. So maybe the 75 basis points makes more sense now than a full hundred basis point hike, right? But another thing that can help there is a slowing economy. If we see a slowing economy like these manufacturing numbers that we got today, 
that could be a good sign. Why is bad news good news this time? Well, because that will go ahead and show to the Fed that we possibly are pushing into a recession here and maybe they'll slow down a little bit. Of course, this is all talk and something that you need to just kind of follow on. It's a fluid situation and something that I would keep my eyes on as an investor. Like always, guys, do me the favor, guys. Hit the thumbs on up. It looks like we only got 143 people here today. That's not enough. I need you guys to help me out. Hit those thumbs on up so that we can get some more traders on in here. All right, let's keep going. Let's get into some other topics on out there. We're going to get into next one is, of course, the highly anticipated merger happening today. Uh, blockchain uh, shift industry ending the mining in Ethereum. The transition of the proof of stake means that the network will be significantly more energy efficient than it was during the proof of work era. Um, so now you're going to see, and a lot of people are calling for a 99.95 reduction in energy consumption, something that we'll definitely have to keep an eye out for. We also got the railroad strike to get averted here. Uh, definitely would have been kind of in a big issue, right? If we have worries about inflation, the number one thing that we don't need right now is some labor strikes, especially when it comes to the railroads, because that would have just destroyed supply chains probably increasing inflation in the short term. Uh, tentative agreement averts the nat national rail strike that would have shut down the key parts of the U.S. transportation network. Um, and we were seeing some, some of these kind of making a little bit of a move for a little bit. And you can see the railroads. I'll put them up here. Um, at least CSX is one that I have up right now. And what did this do? Well, the new contract provided for 24% pay increases over five years from 2020 to 2024. And it included immediate payouts averaging around 11,000 upon ramification, according to the Association of American Railroads. So definitely something to keep a watch. I'm happy this kind of went through, you know, railroad workers i'm sure they're they're working hard and have had a long overdue pay raise so they're at least the strike averted helping out of course um it would have destroyed some supply chains there so at least that worry can get a little bit put to rest now let's uh continue going on we got about a minute or two before we get into our interview um, like always, guys, hit the likes. I know that you guys are excited to hear from Clean Spark. I see you guys in the chat buzzing. Let's keep going here. All right. Now, of course, uh, the other major news on today uh, came in the morning when a lot of people are asking what happened to Adobe. Adobe getting hit hard here. Look at that daily candle. Definitely not what you want to be seeing. And what happened here was the trend that we've been seeing pre-announcements have been where stocks have been hit the hardest. So Adobe uh, com coming out this morning uh, with a rumor out there from Wall Street Journal and now being kind of more in the confirmation is the buying of Figma about 20 billion, a deal that would be roughly paid with half in stock and half in cash. And then they went and then released their earnings a little bit early here, seeing the EPS at 350 versus the 345 estimate and sales at 4.52 versus the 5.8 billion estimate. And this really kind of shook up the stock. It got hit hard and it's continued down here out the open. So we'll see if it's able to recover that opening price. I got an opening price there of 329.40. We'll see if it can get back up there on the day. Adobe definitely getting hit hard today. All right, like always, one of the things that I like to do here on Stock Market Movers is continue with the trends and try to get to the expert opinions to keep you guys in the informational edge. Sometimes this involves bringing in companies, right, and talking about stories on out there. I always like to stay with the trends, so I'm excited to get into our interview today that we're going to be diving into Clean Spark. Yes, um, I know that you guys are in the chat are excited. So if you guys have any question, you guys want to go ahead and throw on up. I'll make sure to try to catch some towards the end of the interview. Let's get into that interview today with Clean Spark as we go ahead and dive into our first interview today. <laughs>
All right, let's go ahead. Let's bring on Matthew Schultz here, the executive chairman of Clean Spark. Welcome to the show, Matthew. Hey, thanks a lot for having me. It's a, it's a great time to be here. Yeah, excited to have you on, ready to dive on into the action. I know that you've uh, recently announced the Malson Inf Infrastructure Group, uh, this acquisition in Sandersville, Georgia, and this brings you guys some more kind of mining equipment. Tell us about the acquisition, what it means for the company, and why this deal made sense. Um, it's a terrific question, and it's a crazy time in our space. So back in November, uh, December, January of last year, we were seeing massive orders of equipment being placed from manufacturers in China. Um, and in Bitcoin mining, they, they price that equipment like dollars per terahash. And, and back then, some of the equipment was selling in the $85 to $100 per terahash price range rather than betting on future orders. And, and what that means to a large degree is a lot, of, a lot of our peer group had to put deposits, 30, 50, even greater percentages of down payments on equipment that when they ordered in November is just beginning to arrive on shore now. So rather than make that type of commitment, we did a, a pretty in-depth analysis of where we saw the market and what that meant for a potential oversupply of rigs. So we started to invest in infrastructure instead. So we actually took an infrastructure first approach. And, and so we started to utilize a little bit more of a strategy over ideology kind of approach to the way we run our business. We were one of the first ones to start actually using Bitcoin uh, to sell, to actually grow our company. And we started when Bitcoin was in the $60,000 range. So Fast forward to the last three weeks, we bought a facility from uh, a, a great group of guys in Washington, Georgia. Um, it was called Waha Technology. Um, when we picked it up, we bought about 3,800 miners there. Uh, since that time, we've added, we, I think we sent 16 53-foot semis full of uh, S19 J Pro, which is the latest, greatest, newest stuff. Um, those are all up in hashing. Uh, we then bought 10,000 more S19J Pros directly from Bitmain. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of those comments that these, these rigs were priced in that $85 to $100 per terahash price range. We picked up this most recent order at $28 a terahash. And then to the question that you specifically ask about, Mawson, terrific group. Um, uh, James and Liam have built a phenomenal uh, business down there in Sandersville, Georgia. It happens to fit in our profile because it's largely powered by um, nuclear power. So it fits our ESG initiative. The price was right. Um, we, we continue to be opportunistic in the space. And aside from buying the facility, we also picked up a, a, a block of their latest generation miners. And we, we were able to get into that contract at about $17 per terahash. So we see this as at or near the bottom. So we're very opportunistic. We're looking for places that we can grow rapidly that provide meaningful accretive value to our shareholders instantly upon execution. Now, of course, everyone wants to know if the plan is to continue here in buying some more, acquiring some more facilities. Anything, is that the plan looking forward? So we've talked about the fact that we intend to be opportunistic. Um, one of the one of the challenges we have is, you know, obviously a publicly traded company is there's a limit on what we can and can't talk about. But I can tell you that we are definitely hunting. Um, we're we're always I, I think that there, it would be safe to say that there are probably always three to five opportunities uh, before our management team at any given time. Um, they have to fit a number of criteria. Right. So it has to be predominantly sustainable or non carbon emitting power. It has to have favorable energy rates. Um, it has to have access to a really qualified workforce and the, 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 the right teams of people. Um, and, it, and it has to fit in our in our overall model. So the, the, the most recent acquisitions, Chris and his partner Houston down at Waha built a terrific little organization. Um, with the economy being what it is, Bitcoin price under pressure, energy prices, especially in those, those markets that are exposed to um, natural gas, the prices are running away. So it's really squeezing those margins. So, you know, being an energy company uh, in our DNA, we've taken these opportunities over where we can utilize 
some of what sets us apart with regard to efficiency and, and the way that we can scale our operations and, and uh, take advantage of, of these times. So I, I would say that, you know, you could, you could definitely assume that we're, we're always in the market um, for the right opportunity that makes sense to our shareholders. All right. Now you recently just released the August 2022 Bitcoin mining update. Can you tell us a little bit about these numbers and how they compare year over year and any thoughts that we can look at moving forward in the operation? Should we kind of expect to get to a certain number by the end of the year? Yep, absolutely. Um, so December of last year, we put out our update and we said we were 1.3 exahash. Um, our most recent update I think we said 3.8 or 3.9 exahash. So in less than a year, we've tripled our hash rate. Um, that does not include the acquisition of Mawson. It does not include the 10,000 S19J pros we just closed on. Those are those are delivery September October or excuse me October November from Bitmain. It also does not include an additional 12 megawatts that are just being energized at our full scale state of the art immersion cooling facility in Norcross, Georgia. So we've given the market guidance that we expect to exceed 5 exahash by the end of the year. And we also talked about the fact that we have line of sight and we gave market direct guidance that we expect to exceed 22.4 exahash next year. So um, simple answer is yes, we're very aggressively growing. Um, the Sandersville project that we acquired has 80 megawatts live. They're, uh, they're, they're breaking ground on an additional 150 megawatt substation on site. Um, that really dramatically changes that infrastructure. Same thing in Washington, Georgia. Um, 36 megawatts on site. There's a 50 megawatt substation um, a, adjacent to our property that's currently under construction. The beauty of all this is all these projects that we've acquired have been right in our sweet spot, which is Georgia. So it takes advantage of the, the Vogel nuclear power plants that are coming online, as well as the ones that already are online. Georgia is an extremely friendly business state with regard to digital currency mining, crypto in general. Um, and, and it's got an amazingly talented workforce. So, so we, we believe that we can very rapidly scale to meet the numbers that we forecast. Um, we have about 40,000 machines operating currently, uh, about 140 megawatts of power, uh, predominantly non-carbon emitting power. So um, I think, you know, if, if you read a lot of the industry reports, you'll see that our, our growth rate is really has surpassed the industry. Um, I was at a conference all week in New York City and there was another conference going on. And I just posted a tweet that, you know, there's a panel from Bitcoin miners at the conference we chose not to attend. And CleanSpark and our acquisition and growth strategy was the topic of that panel. So we're definitely starting to make some noise. I think we're doing the, the right thing, uh, making the correct moves in the space. All right. Now it's on a lot of kind of cryptocurrency investors mind is uh, and I would love to hear your thoughts is what do you think about the ETH merger? You know, we're we're strictly a Bitcoin shop. Um, we come like I said before, you know, we, we came out of the, the energy space. We were building decentralized energy systems in support of uh, military, commercial and industrial providers. So decentralization is really key to us. We believe that the proof of work approach is what provides that decentralization and security, that securitization of the Bitcoin network. I mean, the, the underlying protocols were actually put in, in place a number of years ago to kind of disincentivize people from spam email campaigns and civil attacks because it created an energy cost, effectively a postage that would require somebody to do these mass mailers or spam attacks that, you know, otherwise had had no cost. So roll that forward into the Bitcoin blockchain. Bitcoin is secure because of the fact that for access to the network, that it requires an, an investment in energy. So we see that investment as in energy as a way to incentivize and, and stimulate more renewable energy projects because there's a there's a company like CleanSpark, for example, that has a half a billion dollars on our balance sheet. We have less than $20 million in debt. Um, we all of our properties are, are unleveraged. So we can make um, we can enter into purchase agreements for clean power um, to build new facilities that support the surrounding communities. And, and that makes those energy projects financeable and bankable um, for those developers. Now, comparing that to proof of stake. 
The challenge is that there are tokens on the Ethereum network that, that are exclusively proof of stake. And the, and the challenge is that if you have the, the ability, you could theoretically strong arm that industry or buy a controlling interest. And, and so it would enable, instead of a peer-to-peer -peer network like Bitcoin, it becomes a hedge fund to hedge fund type network. And it enables people to potentially manipulate that network and system, whereas Bitcoin is and proof of stake is always going to be completely decentralized. So we're excited to see what, what comes of it. Um, you know, there are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of GPU miners currently operating on the network. So there's going to be a lot of extra chips for people that are interested in gaming. But, um, you know, we're interested to see how it rolls out. You know, obviously what's good for any crypto is good for, for Bitcoin. So how do you feel about Bitcoin? And um, are we in what's said to be a crypto winter? Yeah, I definitely think we are. Yeah, um, you know, with the with the market conditions, with the you know the 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 numbers that came out yesterday with regard to inflation, you know, CPI is skyrocketing. Um, we we keep talking about the fact that we're approaching the end of the recession, and I think that's created some fear in the market. And what what you know from from your experience and, and many investors do is that fear creates opportunity. So, you know, what we talked about in our last quarter is here we are in the middle of a crypto winter. So the price of Bitcoin is dramatically down. We started selling Bitcoin as part of our capital management strategy back in November of last year in the $60,000 range. We were we were widely panned for that approach. And now many of our peers have been forced to sell here in the you know, high teen range. So we see that this is definitely at or near the bottom, you know, according to all of the research that we've done. Um, so we're definitely in a crypto winter. But but here's where the kind of differentiation comes in. Companies that are positioned well um, can continue to thrive in these markets, as evidenced by our, our, our acquisition and growth strategy. Last quarter, we did $31 million in top line revenue. We posted over $15 million in EBITDA. So, you know, aside from the, you know, we, we took some impairments, um, discontinued operations, moved our energy business kind of out of our continuing operations. So we took some, some non-cash impairments or non-cash write downs during that last quarter. But, you know, from a from a gross perspective, 31 million in revenue and 15 million in profit in the depths of a crypto winter, just it, it, it still demonstrates that there are a ton of opportunities for companies that are positioned properly and execute well. So um, it, it hasn't been great for a lot of companies. It hasn't been great for a lot of investors. Certainly our share price has has suffered drastically. But in light of all that, if you know there are a number of, of different metrics, when you look at the Bitcoin mining sector as a whole, we're by far the best performing of our entire peer group. So, you know, I, I, it's not necessarily a badge of honor to be the least bad, but, you know, we've continued to execute in these in this tough market. And we see that this is presenting a ton of opportunity. So when the when the bottom is in and crypto begins to rebound, it's going to be just like it has been in the last several cycles. That 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 rebound is is very swift and you know could be uh, could be very beneficial for companies that are taking advantage during these times. Yeah. Now, one thing I always look at is relative strength, and sometimes this can be, like you mentioned, which one isn't going as bad as the others. Um, now, what is in the pipeline moving forward? I know you've mentioned a couple of these things, but just want to give you the floor just in case we miss one. No, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to share a strategy. So we've continued to grow. And what's what's important to know is, you know, the, the, the team in, in Washington um, at Waha, really capable group, competent people, they've got a management team. We acquired that facility, acquired those resources. There's no longer a management team, so it expands what our executive team is responsible to do. Same thing um, with the group in, in Sandersville at Mawson. Um, what we did do, and I don't know how many people actually paid very close attention, um, Mawson is a terrific operator. And aside from the, the, the 230 total capacity that we acquired from them in Sandersville, Georgia. They have two more facilities, 200 megawatts total in Pennsylvania, of largely nuclear power. Included in both of their, their public disclosures as well as ours was kind of buried in the bottom, a right of first refusal for CleanSpark to acquire that as well. So there's an additional 200 megawatts of nuclear power that we have a, a right of first refusal to continue to execute, um, to potentially acquire that and continue our growth strategy. And as I mentioned before, we're actively hunting. So 
there there are opportunities um, daily. The the price of Bitcoin mining equipment is certainly under pressure. Um, being at these conferences in New York, we we continue to hear from manufacturers, importers, and providers of equipment and infrastructure about the the glut, um, the oversupply. A number of our peers went all in on miners and didn't focus on infrastructure, and now there are literally tens of thousands of Bitcoin miners sitting on pallets with nowhere to plug them in. So the infrastructure first approach has been something that we've really seized on. We continue to follow that path. So when you know a thousand or two thousand or five thousand machines come available at eighteen or twenty dollars a terahash, we're going to take advantage of that because it's instantly creative value for our shareholders. And you know, as I mentioned before, we'll be five x a hash by the end of the year and twenty two point four by the end of, end of next year, which which puts us you know very solidly in the top two or three producers in the space. And I guess the difference is we own our facilities, we own our infrastructure. We're not subject to the uh, to the great exposure to to co-location hosting expense. Um, we have a lot of control over that. Yeah, I, I was asked in a in an interview in New York in, when I was in New York, what about other companies that have left certain markets because of exposure to energy costs? And what I can say is those companies, a couple of differentiators, those companies are largely hosting facilities. Um, you know, Compass talked about leaving Georgia because the the economics. Well, the challenge is that Compass doesn't own the mining facility. Compass pays someone else. And so when you have two or three people taking a bite of the apple, it really squeezes those margins. And then when you add into the fact that there's mandated um, uptime guarantees, they have to run 98 percent of the time or there's financial penalties. See, we're different because we own our own facilities. We have we've replaced the firmware on all of our mining machines that allow us to overclock, make them run faster and be produce more Bitcoin. But in certain economic conditions, we can also underclock those to decrease the energy consumption and make it financially viable to continue to operate even through those tough times. Additionally, we can automatically curtail. So we get, because of our size, you know, I mentioned our, we're, we're a large player in Georgia. Um, the co-op the co-op is called MEAG that buys the majority of the nuclear power in the state. We're the largest customer of MEAG in the entire state. So they want us to run, they want us to use that load, but because of our scale, we have access to pricing day ahead and in like 15 minute intervals. So we can make a decision that we may curtail for one hour and 45 minutes, meaning that we utilize our operational software to idle those machines. And during those periods of time, we can do like in our in our immersion cool, there's there's fluid that runs through those machines and, and there occasionally there gets contaminants. And just like an oil filter in your car um, or we like to call it dialysis, during those periods of time when we're curtailing power, we use that as our op as an opportunity to perform dialysis, to pump the fluid out of the tank, run it through the filter system, put it back in, replace hash boards or whatever may be necessary to increase the efficiency. And when energy prices drop back down, bam, we're right back in the market. So we we think that, you know, that whole strategy over ideology is, is the continued best choice for our shareholders and for the company's continued growth. Now, I'd like to say it here. Uh, it looks like Matthew looks like Clean Spark is also playing towards your quote. Play like a champion today, right? <laughs> uh, did you go to Notre Dame or is that just kind of a quote that you like? No. So, you know, growing up in uh, in Wyoming and Utah, being a being a Catholic kid, I you know, had to be a, a fan of the Catholic school. So I've been a Notre Dame fan since I was probably six or seven years old. And, you know, I've had the opportunity to speak, to lecture in a couple of classes at the Mendoza School of Business there. Um, been back for many football games. Um, just love the entire program and and love what, what the foundation of that program is all about. So thanks for noticing that. Of course. Thank you for joining me today. The chairman here of uh, Clean Spark, Matthew Schultz, will definitely have you back on. And thank you for coming on. I appreciate being here. Thank you for having us. Look forward to the next time. Have a good one, Matthew. All right, there you guys have it. Went into Clean Spark today. I hope that you guys appreciated me going into a mining company and just getting into a story, right? I think one of the things that is always important is definitely hearing from the executives themselves. What are we looking forward? What is coming? And I think the important part there that I really liked about the interview and what caught my eye was the idea that he didn't shy away from it being a crypto winter. If anything, he sounded more prepared for the crypto winter. So it's something definitely to note. All right, let's continue going here. Let's get back towards the market headlines. And 
Let's take a quick peek at the market action. As you're seeing the SPY bounce back off of the 390s. We'll see if we can get back above the 395s today. Earlier, we were definitely holding around the 395.36 in the intraday. That A close above that would definitely be a nice bullish reversal on the day's action. You can see here we're still fighting kind of the Tuesday low and the Wednesday low. So we'll see what happens here. Definitely holding on to the 390s. And I did see in the chat someone saying that pins was taking off. Kind of interesting to see this one really take off. And you can see that. Definitely a big move there. Let me just uh, quickly get into my Benzinga Pro here to see if I got some news. Looks like I did see some, some call sweeps at the 32s near the ask, uh, but not seeing too much after this. Um, I know that they're at a kind of presenting at a Goldman Sachs uh, conference, so maybe that's what we're seeing this liftoff. I don't have confirmation on that news right now, but definitely big liftoff there for Pinterest. Thank you for noting that in the chat. All right, let's continue going. Let's get into some other headlines that are out there. Trying to keep going with the news. Um, we did talk about Adobe. We're on Humana. Let's get into Humana's news today. Um, and this did get a big pop over oh, in the pre-market hours. So let's go and take a look at how it's trading on the intraday. This is HUM. Take a look at the action. Definitely getting a pop there. It's all the way up almost to 500 now. Let's talk about what happened here. So Humana hosting its virtual investor day today, Thursday at 8.30. So if you guys missed it, maybe you guys can catch it again to hear what was spoken. Some of the uh, kind of important facts here. Humana introduced midterm adjusted EPS target of 37 in 2025 and raised full year 2022 adjusted EPS financial guidance to approximately $25 on the investment day versus the 2483 estimate. So definitely getting some lift and love off of this. Investors are liking this. Will it get to the 500 today? Big push on up in Humana. And it's also affecting other health care plan stocks. So I'll take a look there at the health care plan stocks. You guys know how I like to follow along with the other movers also, not just Humana. One that I like today was ELV. I've been watching this one on the daily chart. I was looking to see a move if we were going to get a move back above 500. Yesterday, it broke through kind of this triangle here that was trying to hold. It broke down to 470. I was going to take a look today to see if we could recover back. Looks like we've recovered. Keeping this one on my radar, if I'm going to see, still see Humana taking the nice lift, this one could be one to watch also. And you can see uh, UNH, United Health also ripping on this, uh, CNC, MOH, Molina Healthcare is another one that I've been keeping a close eye. I really like the way this one's setting on up for a move back towards 355. We'll see what happens in these, but definitely keep them on your radar. Even CVS has been getting news lately, right? Look at that move back on up. That's looking a uh, bullish, holding the 200-day pullback today and now pushing towards the highs. We'll see what happens here in these healthcare plan stocks. All right, let's keep going. Let's get into the other stock that I caught moving today, and it was moving pretty fast. Um, so I know a lot of people are probably wondering, why is Roku up today? And I was wondering also, I could see it immediately, caught it on live trading that it was getting a nice little spark right out the gates there. You could see it here on that first candle. It was a nice little push, and it pushed there until about 1020, then started going a little bit sideways here. But what happened here? Why is Roku moving up? Well, the rumor mill is really kind of moving up and it's going into overdrive on Roku, potentially being acquired. This came from Deal Reporter as reported by The Fly. Uh, the publication focuses on merger and acquisitions. They revealed that Roku had made a number of amendments to severance language in their executive contracts, highlighting a curious focus on change in control, which addresses what happens in the event of an acquisition. Of course, this is majorly important to, let's say, an ETF like ARK that is one of their biggest positions is Roku. We'll see what happens here in Roku if an acquisition is really in kind of the works. Something to keep on watch as you're definitely seeing it rebound today up towards the 75 We'll see if it gets to the 80s and catches the bounce. What do you guys think about Roku? Do you think it could be an acquisition target? Let me know in the chat what you guys think. 
All right, let's keep going about getting out of Roku. Let's go towards the next one. And the question that I had today, and I'm sure a lot of investors were asking is, why are EV charging stocks up? Look at all these that were kind of making a good move today. Volta, Blink, ChargePoint, EVgo. These were some of the stocks that we pointed out on live trading. So if you guys haven't checked out live trading, that's every single morning, 9 a.m., uh, don't miss it right here on Benzinga. But let's go ahead. Let's get into some of these charging stocks that we're making moves on up. And you can see ChargePoint. I've talked about this 20 level being so important. If we could get back to 20, this was really going to start looking bullish. And now you're there. Now I'll be looking for pullbacks on this. If I could get a pullback on it, I definitely will keep watch to see where I can kind of come back into this. I'd be looking for somewhere around 17 to around 18, somewhere in between there. A good pullback would be something that I'd be watching. But this one's really starting to look stronger, charge point. But it was also EVgo. Uh, you could see EVgo getting some lift on up there. Uh, Blink getting some lift. And Volta also getting some lift. I saw all these kind of moving hand in hand. So keep these ones on your radar. We'll see if they can continue making runs. But why are they moving? That's the important part here. Well, President Joe Biden will provide $900 million towards building an EV charging network. The network would span 53,000 miles of highway in 35 states. Over five years, the U.S. government will provide $5 billion of grants towards building EV chargers. So this is definitely something to keep your eyes on as you're seeing ChargePoint take off. A lot of this coming on investment news and talks uh, here about building the EV charging network. We'll see if they can continue making runs. Um, and if there's one that was lagging a little bit other than the others, I would say it was Volta. Um, it's, just, it's a lower price one and it's moving slower. It did make a nice little move on up, but not a significant one. Just keep it on your radar. We'll see if it can continue following the other names. All right. And then there was also uh, another news that came out of DHR that was important here. Uh, Danaher, let's talk a little bit about that here as we get here. Danaher announced uh, its intention to separate its environmental and applied solution segment to create an independently public traded company. The company will be comprised of Danaher's water quality and product identification business and would be referred to as EAS until a later name date. And you can see here, it kind of came down right back to the support. It didn't really kind of hold that pop, but you didn't break the low of that, the 281.73. You did pull back a significant amount. So I'd look to see if it could at least kind of close back up towards the 290s. Right now, it is catching a little bit of a bounce, but of course, uh, we need to keep on watch how this will affect the new company. And it usually doesn't affect too much at the, at the same moment, right? It might be giving them a little bit more of a profitable outlook, but it's still a part of the company. We'll see what happens there. DHR, Danaher, definitely coming down in the intraday. Will it close back that up above 290s there? All right, getting out of that one in about two or three minutes, we're going to get into our next interview. Just want to keep going with the headlines and keep them going here. Next headline was on Ford. So let's go to Ford, see how it's trading on the intraday. You can see a nice little pop there. And Ford unveiled the redesign of the 2024 Mustang hardtop convertible with none other than Gas-powered engines. It looks like that's what they're talking about here. We know customers do want the internal combustion on some of them, and some of them want electric. We want to offer both in the Mustang family, said Jim Owens, head of Mustang marketing, uh, during a media briefing. And Chevrolet, of course, is expected to end production of gas-powered Chevy Camaro in the coming years as a part of General Motors' plan to exclusively offer EVs by 2035. So I think this is just interesting. You know, I don't think it's massive, you know, towards the bottom line of Ford, but something that might keep them a little bit in more of a forefront is if they do have at least a sports car with a gas powered engine. I know that EVs sometimes are even faster. I mean, we can tell by, you know, the Tesla S, but I can tell you right now, there's still nothing, at least in my eyes, like, you know, driving a Ford Mustang. I've had one before. 
nothing bad with a, a stick Mustang. It's definitely fun to drive. All right, let's keep going. We're going to get out of that. We're going to go towards our interview today. We'll see what happens when Ford. A lot of this has been kind of the recent lift that we've been seeing in Tesla. And I was interested to see if Tesla could close into the green today because it's starting to look better. It's starting to look like Tesla wants to kind of hold the chart looking well here after we're starting to hold the pullback on the 200 day. I definitely keep that one in my radar around 293s, 99 is the SMA right now. If it can hold that 200 day and now you're starting to see all the moving averages move below the price action, showing us that the trend is starting to come on up. Let's see if it can kind of give that push. A move to 320s would definitely start getting it more in that bullish sense. Let's see if it can get finally through the highs on the left-hand side here. Um, as you see some kind of turnaround here, right around, I would say around the 311.75s. There's some extremes towards 302, but definitely a close back above that 311. And we're looking better for Tesla. And we'll see what happens. Of course, Twitter news could always change around Tesla. But for right now, I'm actually liking this chart for kind of the large caps. This actually looks a lot better than let's say like a Microsoft that is starting to break down a long term trend line there that I'm concerned about. If that breaks, where does Microsoft kind of stop? Right. And that's the concerning things. If I'm looking at some of the higher price, higher quality names, Tesla's chart actually doesn't look like this. It looks like it's trying to hold a bullish tune. We'll see what happens there in some of the leaders. All right, getting out of that, let's go ahead. Let's get into our second interview today. Like always, this is always about trying to give you guys all the headlines that are out there on stock market movers and keep to the expert opinions to keep you guys in the informational edge. So let's get into our second interview today and let's dive on in. All right, let's bring on Andrew Thrasher here, portfolio manager of the Financial Enhancement Group and founder of the Thrasher Analytics. Welcome onto the show, Andrew. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. Definitely excited to go ahead and get started. First thing, I want to know a little bit more about yourself and Thrasher Analytics. Tell us about it. Sure. So I, my primary, uh, primary hat that I wear is being a portfolio manager for Financial Enhancement Group managing uh, the assets of our clients. I also write an institutional level uh, letter, weekly letter through Dash Analytics, looking at different market timing strategies, looking at volatility type research sectors, um, and just kind of sharing a lot of my commentary and, and proprietary models there. Um, so looking, my primary way I look at the market is through technicals. I'm a CMT, I'm a chartered market technician. Um, so I'm really focused on the price action. Uh, I'm less concerned with the day-to-day -day headlines and the news. I, I, I watch them and pay attention. Um, respect earnings announcements, but I'm really focused on uh, the daily charts. Well, I, I can't blame you for being a CMT. I'm actually working on my level two right now, but awesome. we'll, we'll save that for another conversation. Let's get into the overall market sentiment. How do you feel about it right now? Sure. We've been, we've had a pretty much a, almost a full year, a, a kind of a risk off defensive bias. We started um, pretty early, not early last year, but later in the back half of last year before the market peaked, really honing in on the lack of participation in the overall trend. Um, I write a public blog at athrasher.com and started publishing there just about that we really were only seeing the market being carried higher by a handful of stocks, basically just the, the FANG stocks as they eventually got named. And so we came into this year a little bit cautious. Then our model started to see the trend started to reverse. And we've been basically defensive all year long, um, looking opportunistically at certain sectors, um, utilities, ener energy is something we've played, played with most of the year, as well as some, some tech healthcare throughout the year. Um, but pretty much been defensive as we continue to see support levels break um, and resistance levels hold up. It, it's hard to get overly constructive on this market. Hopefully, maybe we can see a year-end rally. But right now, we continue to be more defensive, a little bit cash-heavy, um, and trying to keep just manage that beta from day to day. Let's dive into a little bit more of your process here. So one thing that I wanted to ask on is being a portfolio manager, you have to kind of know how to find good quality plays, right? How do you feel you can look for good quality opportunities that are in the market? So our, most of our portfolios are broken up into, we have some that are entirely systematic. 
Um, they're driven by what the signals that our, that our models are telling us. And so it's less, there's really no discretion in those. Um, some of our sector rotation models, some of our timing models, they're entirely what, what the model says is what we do. Um, for some of the, the areas that we do get to be a little bit more opportunistic in and have some discretion area, of, um, we do try to combine um, both earnings and some of the fundamental lens with my technical lens. Um, I co-manage our assets with a CFA. And so he really dives in um, into the, the companies themselves. But we start looking for things that are going to have a catalyst. Um, so something that we've played a lot with is different commodities and energy this year. Um, we feel like there's been a lot of catalysts to that space. And the price action has very much reflected that um, as it's, as the, the solid relative performance. And then looking at certain uh, specific plays, whether it's in natural gas or different um, drillers, explorers, we, we've kind of been, gone across the gamut with the energy market, um, trying to best position ourselves. But we try to find areas that are maybe going to have a catalyst, whether it's from the, the economy or just something that's developing the market from a relative strength perspective. And then we start to try to narrow that down, in either using individual stocks or we'll just use uh, some broad based ETFs. Excellent. Now, are there any themes or industries that you have on watch for a longer style kind of investment? We, like I said, we've been in energy for pretty much all year long. Um, our sector rotation model has, for there's been a couple of times where it, it's fallen out, but for most months, our sector rotation model has been in energy. Um, so from, again, our systematic perspective, we've been in energy. And then there's also just been certain names, um, certain nat, nat gas uh, stocks. Can't get into what those are, um, but I can say that we have tried to get a little bit more uh, focused in, in how we're playing energy. Um, but I think that's been a continued theme. It's only been exacerbated by what's going on with Europe and the European energy crisis. Um, we think that there are certain players in the U.S. that can benefit from that. Um, so we've tried to get positioned there. Um, I think energy is constantly in the headlines for different reasons. We're seeing nat gas down pretty big today after they get the resolution of the strike with the, uh, the railroads. I think that's more news-driven, headline-driven. We're watching if nat gas can hold the 50-day moving average, specifically looking at the, um, that one contract. Um, but we think energy continues to have a lot, lot still left to go. Um, commodities in general, we think there's still a lot of catalysts left in the, in the commodities market, specifically the ag space. Um, we're seeing more and more headlines of countries starting to um, limit their amount of exports, we're watching crop reports, seeing how much of supply we're going to have. And we think that there's still some potential in a lot of the ag names. Um, again, they're all, often always in the, the headlines uh, for one reason or another, but we continue to watch. Um, energy markets, ag markets, um, but as a broad, as far as the broad equity market goes, we're still pretty defensive. Um, so we manage the beta of the portfolio, the amount of risk exposure we have um, pretty, pretty tightly right now. Now, I, I heard you mention a lot on natural gas, so we won't mm -hmm. touch too much on that. But what about oil? How do you feel about oil overall? It's been kind of a battle here. And I've been seeing, you know, of course, uh, going as high as 120 yeah. and then coming down towards the 80. Do you feel like we're stuck in a range here or do you feel that we're going to finally start trending in an area? I mean, right, we've, I think it's kind of both. We've been in a range. Yes, I think that the, the break, I think, is there's. My expectation is that we'll break higher or break lower. Outside of Putin waving the white flag and we see just some reflexive trade uh, of that, um, but I still don't think that's enough probably to really break the back of oil. When we start looking at the crack spread, we start looking at the energy names, they continue to trend higher. The crack spread is, is the comparison of oil to the products made from oil. Um, and then looking at the spread there, that started to roll over a little bit, but it's been a lot more firm. It's been stayed a lot higher than the price of oil. Um, oil continues to hold support levels. It's still respecting a lot of key price levels, something that we're not seeing on the equity side. We're seeing price levels for the equities, um, for, for the S&P, the NASDAQ, what have you, respecting resistance, whereas oil is respecting support. And so that tells us that the bulls, the buyers still appear to be primarily in control there. Um, I think some of where a lot of people get off wrong on oil is it's a different animal to trade than what maybe they're used to. We spend such a long time of everyone kind of ignoring energy, ignoring oil, because it's been in such a long downturn that they forgot how those types of markets react. It's a much more volatile product to trade and to be in and out of than your typical Apple stock or, or what uh, the, the, um, ARC ETFs, which have gotten pretty volatile now, but the, the things that have people gotten more accustomed to, oil has a lot more volatility to it. Commodities in general are more volatile. And so I think we have to respect that and, and, and allow that be part of an input to a, to a process 
realizing that a nature of the beast is volatility. And so it's going to have some big gyrations like we're seeing today and this this week. Um, and so, but I don't think that's enough to discount saying that oil has peaked and we're going to go right back down to $50 a barrel or go back to negative like in March, 2020. Um, the fact that Biden's come out saying he wants to refill the SPR around $80, I think it's terrible that they came out and said that because now you're just putting a bid under it at $80. But we obviously know now the government's going to be a buyer, a natural buyer at that level. And so I think you still have a lot of catalysts like that. Um, introduce again what's going on in Europe. There's still a lot of catalysts I think that can move oil higher. Um, so we continue to, to have a, a more of a bullish bias towards that specific commodity. Excellent. Um, I'll go ahead and wrap it up with that one. I think you you really hit it on the head there. Uh, so I appreciate you coming on sure. today, Andrew. Uh, something that we'll definitely keep on watch. La one last one. I'll, I'll talk about kind of uh, bottoming process. What do you look to call bottoms? Do you have kind of a process? Do you use indicators? What would you kind of look at? Yeah, so in Thresher, with my Thresher Licks letter, I have two, two primary models for that type of thing. We have something that's an aggressive and more conservative. For our aggressive type model, we're looking really for capitulatory type signs, things that we would see back in, in June. Um, I think we're pretty much sentiment has totally got blown out, where everyone has turned bearish, where we're seeing volume and volatility really start to, to get moving higher. Um, some of the characteristics we look for for a possible bottom. Um, our conservative model, what we use primarily with, within managing assets at Financial Enhancement Group, is really looking for improvement. We want to start seeing breadth data improve, more stocks making new three months, six month highs, recover those 200 moving averages. We really want to start to see the data start to improve and that will get our longer term model to turn positive. Right now, again, we're still on defense there. So we're not seeing enough positive signs yet, but for a bottoming process, we'd rather, instead of trying to get the actual low, we'd rather get a couple percent above it, five, 10, whatever percent above it, um, and be more confident that the worst of the storm is behind us versus just trying to catch that falling knife. So we do have some aggressive models that try to do that, but our primary focus is really trying to look on when the data has started to improve. That's when we start to get more constructive on the equity market. Well, thank you for joining me today, Andrew. Andrew Thrasher, Portfolio Manager of the Financial Enhancement Group and also founder of the Thrasher Analytics. Appreciate you coming on, Andrew. Thanks. Have a great one. All right. We're going to go ahead and start wrapping on up in a second. We still got a lot of headlines we can go through. I'm going to try my best to get to um, one that I thought was really important, which was Bed Bath & Beyond. I know that a lot of people are probably watching this stock um, a little bit closely after, you know, the recent kind of meme kind of another meme rip. So let's take a look here at what happened to Triple B Y. Uh, and that's how I call it there, triple B Y. Let's take a look here at how it's trading off of this report. Um, and it's actually trading up. That's the interesting part. So they released a list of dozen stores that it will close. The struggling home good retailer said it would close about 150 uh, stores as it works to stabilize its finances and turn around declining sales. The retailer's workforce is getting smaller too as it cuts corporate and supply chain staff by about 20% here. Um, this company definitely not looking the best in the financials, uh, but we'll see kind of in their financials, but we'll see if they can bounce back, right? I think it probably gets back here around the five, $6 level. Then we'll see if it can ever come back. A little part of me just doesn't know that they have the innovation or kind of the restructuring of their business in the way that will keep them alive, but we'll see what happens here in Bed Bath and Beyond. All right, let's do uh, one last headline here. I did see kind of, oh, we can we could take a look at this one. Uh, let's go to Netflix. Uh, Netflix was getting kind of a ratings change today, and that's why you're seeing Netflix up a significant amount. Let's talk about that ratings change. That rating change came from Evercore ISI, upgrading the, to outperform from inline. Evercore based its opinion on Netflix revenue opportunities from its planned ad-supported tier on password sharing. Um, password sharing, I don't think, is really going to be something that Netflix ever really gets fixed. That's just my opinion. I mean, I don't know, but it's something that I don't think they're going to get it right. Now, the ad supported tier is something that I think is going to be a good thing for them because in a time when the consumer is looking to spend less 
on, let's say, consistent subscription revenues, right? Well, a good way is give them an ad supported tier. Let them step a, a step down versus completely going away from Netflix, which I think is going to be important, especially if we're going into a recession time. And so we'll see what happens there on the rating of Netflix. It definitely got a little bit of a bounce. I'm sure it probably even Disney caught a little bit of a bounce on this. Let me see. Oh, a little bit of a bounce. It didn't get too big on there, but we'll see what happened on Netflix. And if this gets some of the streaming stocks moving, I don't think it's going to be uh, for all the stocks, but Netflix is something to keep on watch. We'll see if they're ever able to kind of get back on up through the big gap zone that was created, of course, with their earnings. Um, it's starting to try to get back into there. We'll see if it can get back into that shadow zone. A move towards 260 is what you want to see if you're a bull in Netflix. We'll see what happens there. And let's start wrapping it up. It's 2 o'clock. I'm going to start wrapping up. I hope that you guys enjoyed the action today. We had a lot of topics to touch. Didn't get through every single one. I tried, but it was action-packed. And that's all I can do for you guys is bring you guys as much as possible in a one-hour period. All right, so we touched initial jobless claims, import prices, retail sales, manufacturing data, ETH merger, railroad strike averted, Roku, charging station stocks, and more. Uh, a lot going on in the market today. There's a lot of movement. Are we continuing on the up trail? Well, nope. We knocked it right back down here, so we'll see what happens in the SPY. A move back towards 395 closing. That's what the bulls want to see. A move below 390s today, and the Bears take control. We'll see what happens there in the overall market. Like always, do me the favor. Hit the thumbs on up if you guys enjoyed today's action and the way that I carry the show. I'll see you guys next time. Of course, don't miss out at the close at 3.30. Uh, we don't have the roadmap coming on next, so there will be a little bit of a break in our coverage. I'll see you guys a little bit later at 3.30 Eastern with Joel Alconin as we go through the market and check out the close. And will the spy hang on? Let's go ahead and find on out. Hit the like before you get on out of here. I hope you guys appreciated getting into some great guests today. We had two great guests on. We had Clean Spark, the company, CLSK, Matthew Schultz, definitely giving us a great interview. And of course, Andrew Thrasher, Portfolio Manager of Finance Enhancement Group and the founder of Thrasher Analytics. It was a great one. I'll see you next time right here on Stock Market Movers.